If you are a teenager at Grace Mount High School and you decide that you want to start following Jesus, your life at Grace Mount High School is going to get harder. Yep. Right? No doubt. You're going to be bullied, you'll be called a Bible basher, you'll probably be labelled a homophobic, judgmental nut job. That'll be life. If you are a kind of self sufficient, proud, independent mum or dad in Grace Mount, and you decide you want to start following Jesus, life for you will probably get harder. Right? Pursuing humility in life, living now kind of independent with a local church family, it will feel like wading through treacle compared to the life that you're used to. It will feel like daily having to admit your weaknesses, it will feel like daily you are being a betrayal of the kind of proud independent person that you used to be. Life will get harder. If you are an addict who has battled addiction to alcohol or drugs or whatever it might be, and you decide that you want to get clean by following Jesus, I can guarantee you your life will get harder, not easier. You'll be pursued by a guilt that you've never known before. Your loyalties will be questioned by those that you used to be tight with. And you may even need to leave a friendship group that you once loved because they could drag you back in. If you are a retired professional couple who had the dream of just that kind of easy retirement, playing golf, jet-setting across the world, and you start or try following Jesus, your retirement will be harder than if you didn't follow Jesus. Instead of laying down your tools and indulging self, Jesus calls you to lay down your life, the rest of your life, to serve the world and to serve his church. So here's my question. If, for all of these different types of people, life is made harder by being a Christian, why bother? What's the point? Why would you follow Jesus? Why would you obey God when it is going to mean a harder life than if you didn't? Well, I want to bring these questions to Genesis chapter 11 and 12. Because in Genesis 11 and 12, you meet a guy called Abraham. If you know anything about the Bible, you may know that this dude, Abraham's name, eventually is called Abraham. All right? His name has changed. And he's going to become one of the major figures in the whole Bible. And I want to give you a little bit of background stuff on him, just so that you can see what's relevant for what we're looking at today. Have a look at chapter 11, verse 29. Chapter 11, verse 29 reads, Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarah was, Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. So Abraham, who's going to become Abraham, marries Sarai, who's going to get her name changed to Sarah. And the significant detail we're told in chapter 11, verse 30, about Sarah is what? She is childless. She's barren. She's infertile. You could call her sterile Sarah. a nice name. But it shows you what is dominant about her in this narrative. She cannot have children. First thing, I want you to remember that. Second thing, look at chapter 11, verse 31. Terah took his son Abraham and his grandson Lot of Haran, uh, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abraham, and together they set out from Ur to the child of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. So here's Abraham with his wife Sarah, Sarah, and they've settled with their family in this place called Haran. Today, that's like modern-day Turkey. All right, if you want to orientate on a map, Turkey. So they're settled. They're comfortable. So his wife's called Sarai, she's childless, they're settled in Haran. The third detail you don't actually get in Genesis, but we're told later in a book of the Bible called Joshua, chapter 24, verse 2, and you are told that Abraham's dad and the rest of that family are at this point worshipping idols. Listen to what it says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. So what does that tell you about Abraham? In our language today, he's not like born and raised in a Christian home. He's a pagan. 
He's worshipping the gods of the people around him in Haran. So here's three significant details. He's married with problems, can't have kids. He's settled and he's surrounded by family in this place called Haran. And he's worshipping other gods. You getting a picture of the guy? He's not actually that far away from some of us. Married with problems, settled, surrounded by family, and living life like everyone else in his little culture. Until, look at chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Here's the first blank in your sheets. The Lord said, Go. Alright. Now, interesting, if you've read Genesis with us so far, you should recognize those phrases, and the Lord said. That's the language that was used in the creation account when God said, and the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light. These are words that speak of the creative power of the word of God. So when we read it again in the life of Abraham, the Lord had said, you are meant to think, okay, this creative power of God is about to do something Massive, something significant, something new with this man Abraham. You're about to witness the power of the creator God. He speaks and stuff happens. And Abraham may be this kind of idol worshipper, but he is still one of the Lord's creatures. And so the Lord comes and speaks to him and says, go. It's fascinating. It's not defined by where he's meant to go yet. All right, He says to the place that I'll show you. The go is not defined or it's not clear on where he's going. It's just clear on what he is to leave behind. Have a look at what are the three things he's told to leave. Go from your country, from your people, and from your father's household. There are three significant things. Leave your country, leave your family, leave your dad's household. So far in Genesis... The word of God has created colourful abundance. Now that same word of God commands costly obedience. Leave, leave, leave. Go, go, go. Now put yourself in Abraham's shoes. You're chilling in Haran, just getting on with every day, working away. Wife called Sarai, worshipping other gods. Life is normal. Then all of a sudden, out of the blue, like a bolt of lightning, like a slap in the face in a cold day, a voice speaks to you. Go. Leave it all. How are you responding? Nay chance. Nay chance. Not a, on this, all he is told so far is, this is going to mean leaving everything you've ever known. It's not actually that attractive an offer, right? It's not a particularly attractive offer on the table. It sounds a little bit like some of the commands of Jesus. Let me read you some of the words of Jesus. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he sees two brothers, Simon called Peter, his brother Andrew. They're casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. I'll send you out to fish for people. Leave everything you've known and follow me. Elsewhere he'll say, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Wow. He's calling you to leave that. Another one, Jesus says to a rich young man, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, then you'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. Wow. Costly obedience. How can the word of God ask that of Abraham? How can he command that of Abraham? How can Jesus ask that of disciples? Well, because is what I want to show you. God's command to go is always interlocked with God's promise of I will. Alright? Look at chapter 12, verse 2. We're going to see the Lord's commands are backed by the Lord's promises. The Lord says, go. Then he says, I will. Verse 2. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You hear the I wills? 
How can he command Abraham to go? Well, it's on the basis that he is promising him, saying, I will. Now, you can look at this promise in a couple of different ways. On the one hand, you can look at it as one massive general promise to Abraham. And the general promise is this. I will bless. I will bless. The word bless comes up a lot there. And it can mean some different things in the Bible. Sometimes it just means happy. Sometimes it's deeper than that and it can mean saved. But whenever you see that word blessing in the Bible, it is fundamentally linked to a relationship with God. It is to know the creator God. That is blessing. The blessing of the Lord promising I will bless is actually found in that little word, I. That it is the Lord saying, I, me, the Lord God, the creator God, the God who knows you and made you, I. I will put myself into relationship with you. That's the blessing that Abraham is promised. That even though life may get harder following God, it will be better because you know God. This is a blessing of a relationship with God that Adam and Eve loved and lost in Eden. It's a blessing of a relationship with God that Noah knew when he was saved by the ark. It's the blessing where God chooses to create you, relate to you, speak with you, and bless you. I mean, think of Abraham, right? He sat in Haran, probably with some wooden idols that he has carved out of a tree. What can they do for him? Bog all. Can they speak to him? No. They have the capacity to create as much life as Sarah's womb. They're dead. And now the Lord God comes and speaks to him, who made heavens and earth, and he says, I will bless you. However, the blessing is not just general, it is massively specific. Look what he's promised. Look at verse 2 and 3 again. First, promised a great nation. His family will be Mahusiv. He is then promised a great name. His fame will be massive. But notice, what is this fame for? What is this nation for? It is not for his own sake. It is not so he can indulge himself. What is it for? He is blessed so that he would be a blessing. He's made into a great nation so that he can bless every nation on the planet earth. His name will be famous so that he can take God's name to the ends of the earth. I don't know if this illustration works. Think of it like this. Abraham is not consuming blessing just so he can get a full stomach. He's consuming blessing like a mother bird consumes food so that he can then fly to the nest and regurgitate that food for others. That makes sense? Yeah. So Abraham consumes blessing so that he can puke it up for others, is the picture. Did you get that? Does that work? Not having that. But you, the point is, it's not just self-indulgence. He is blessed so that he can share that with other people. Sorry for the image. And hearing the promises of the Lord, what is unbelievable about Genesis chapter 12 is that although Abraham is told to leave everything that he has known, everything that he has loved, because of the promise of God, look what he does in Genesis chapter 12 verse 4. Three very simple words. So Abraham went. Based on the I wills, God's promise to bless, he goes. God's obedience to leave. Read on from verse 4. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. <coughs> Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions he accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Fundamental, right? The word of God, just like in creation, makes stuff happen. God's I will empowers Abraham's go, just as in creation. Think about it. God spoke and said to things that did not yet exist yet. Let there be light, and there was light. Here God speaks to an idol-worshipping wanderer in a random place called Haran, and speaks to him when his faith in God does not yet exist, and says, go, and Abraham goes. 
without any down payment, without any foretaste of it, without any kind of anything apart from the naked promise of the word of God, Abraham goes. And once he's there, the promises of God get loaded even more. Look at verse 6. Abraham travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. That's plumb in the centre of Canaan. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared them. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on his west and I on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued towards the Negev. It's fascinating, right? When he sat in Haran, all he gets is a voice speaking to him. Go. So when he gets up and obeys the command by trusting in the promises, he leaves, he settles in Canaan. The next time the Lord doesn't just speak to him, what does he do? He says it twice in the verses you just read. The Lord doesn't just speak, the Lord appears. It seems that the, the deeper Abraham goes into obedience, the further he has left his old life behind, the more of God he sees. Do you see that? But he has to leave, he has to obey, before he goes into this deeper experience of who God is. I don't know if this applies, but maybe some of us have sat here saying, I've sat in church for years, I've read the Bible, I've sung the songs, I've kind of been around, but I've never got what people have got so excited about this whole Christian gig. Maybe it's because you've never actually taken that step to believe the promises of God, start obeying the word of God, because it's not until Abraham left that the Lord appears to him. Do you see? But as he sees more of God, amazingly, God graciously gives more blessing. So he's been promised great nation, great name. Now he is promised the land. See this place you're now standing, Abraham, Canaan, which is currently full of Canaanites. It is not going to be theirs for long. It is going to be whose? Not his, but his offspring. Your children and your children's children are going to inherit this land of Canaan. Great nation, great name, promised land. Now you should be starting to make something in your head saying, okay, I'm getting this. Abraham's called to leave his land. He's now promised another land. He's told to leave a family, but he's promised a massive family. He's asked to leave his father's household and therefore his inheritance, but God is promising him a name that will be known all over the world. Do you see what God is doing? Everything you are told to leave, God will replace. In fact, everything that you leave will be replaced with more. The Lord is promising to bless Abraham so that the leave, leave, leaves are covered by the I wills, the I wills, the I wills. The cost of being a Christian is outweighed by the blessings of being a Christian. That's the point. And so Abraham trusted that. He trusts God's word. And so wherever he went in that promised land, did you notice what he did? What did he build? An altar. Where he falls down on his face and he worships, he sings to, he prays, calling on the name of the Lord. That's significant. <coughs> last week we saw all these people in a place called Babel. And what were they building? A tower. What was the point of the tower? To make a name for themselves. Abraham doesn't make anything to make his own name famous. He builds things to call on the name of the Lord. That's his only lasting legacy in the land of Canaan. Now, you got the story. Leave, leave, leave. I will, I will, I will. Are you with me? Because I want to, if we've got that, I want to show you two massively important things about the promise of God that applies for us in Grace Mount today. So are you with me? All right, number one, the first kind of application. When the Lord says, I will, he will. When the Lord says, I will, he will. That is another way of saying, when the Lord makes a promise, he'll keep it. Some of us know the agony of people that have not kept their promises to us. God is not like that. 
But at this point in Genesis, you could have every reason for doubting whether or not God would keep this promise. He has made a promise to Abraham that he would have a massive family. What is the obstacle in the way of that? Sarah is barren. God, you've promised a massive family to a man who's got a sterile wife. Interesting. And yet from a dead womb, God is going to fulfill his promise and bring a family that will grow into the nation of Israel that will mean that we still know Abraham's name thousands of years later. There's a book in the Bible, we go Genesis, so it's Numbers, right? Numbers is a book full of numbers, right? Clever name. Twice in the book of Numbers, they take a census of all the people in the nation of Israel. And it's specifically a census of the fighting men. So the warriors. And they take it as they're about to go into the land of Canaan that God promised to Abraham and his descendants in Genesis 12. And so they count. And they count and they count the warriors of God's people until they get to a number that is 603,550. That's a lot of people. 603,550. Where did they come from? Now actually, if that's just the fighting men, add on women and children and non-fighting men, you're probably up to 2, 3 million. Where has that nation come from? Sarai's dead woman. Now, she's not had 600,000 babies. But in terms of from Abraham and Sarah to Isaac, and through that family, God has done what? A great nation. Every name in numbers is one number more than sterile Sarah could produce herself. Every number in the book of Numbers is the proof that when God says, I will, he will. The fact that you now know Abraham's name today in Grace Mount is proof that when God says, I will, he will. You'd have no reason to know that name. A random nobody from Haran. And yet you know it. Why? Because when the Lord says, I will, he will. The fact that you can look and see that from Abraham and Sarai came a family that didn't just grow into Israel, but was... One of their descendants was Jesus, the Christ. That through him, all nations have been blessed. It's proof that when God says, I will, he will. The Apostle Paul, writing after Jesus, says that if you are a Christian, you're a child of Abraham. Listen to these words. This is from Galatians 3. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. What is God telling to Abraham in Genesis 12? The gospel, Paul says, about Jesus, so that if you are a Christian who's put your faith in Jesus, you're a child of Abraham, which means you are proof That when God says, I will, he will. I mean, it's hard to get your noggin around. But what God is promising to Abraham in Genesis 12 is you. When he tells Abraham in chapter 15 of Genesis to count the stars, Abraham is counting you, if you're a Christian. So let me speak to you if you're a Christian. You need to hear these words. That God will speak to you this morning and say, when I say I will, I will. You can trust his promises. Here's what I know about myself. I I cannot obey God's command to go and leave my former life unless I trust his promises. I cannot obey God's command to repent of my sins and leave it all behind unless I believe what he's done for me in Jesus Christ. And so if you're the teenager at Graceland High School, you need to trust this promise that when you're bullied, God will never leave or forsake you. And beyond this world will be justice for bullies and peace for you. Or if you're the proud, independent, self-sufficient mum or dad that's battling for humility, you need to know God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. 
And that rather than leaning on your own understanding, if you trust him in all your ways, he will make your path straight. It may not be easy, but it will be better than anything you've ever known. If you're the battling addict, you need to know that in the gospel there's not only forgiveness from sin and failure, but there is also power and transformation to change. And there is a future where you will leave all your sin behind and you will be freed to sin no more when you spend eternity with Jesus in the new creation. You need to trust that promise. But you will never manage to leave your old life behind if all you ever do is look at what you've left behind. You need to look forward to the fulfillment of God's promises because when he says, I will, he will. If you're not a Christian, you need to hear the Lord speak to you this morning and say, when I say I will, I will. He comes to you and speaks to you like he spoke to Abraham in Haran. He speaks to you in grace like this morning. And that authoritative, powerful command of God says, leave, repent. And believe the good news about Jesus. Believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he dies suffering the curse that your sin deserves so that you can be brought into the blessing of relationship with the creator, saviour, God. You need to repent and believe. And trust me, it will make your life harder, but it will be worth leaving everything for to know the blessing now of trusting God and knowing God and the blessing of knowing heaven rather than hell when you die. Jesus says, follow me. He says, repent and believe. You need to hear this first thing then. When God says, I will, he will. You get that? Second thing. This is going to take a little bit of explaining. The Lord's promise to me is bigger than me. This is the last blank on your sheet. The Lord's promise to me is bigger than me. You could add into that, it's not just bigger than me, it's bigger than this world. That's what I want to show you. So we can look back at Abraham, and we can see that the Lord fulfilled these promises. We can see he's promised a great nation, and we can read in numbers to 603,000 people. He kept that promise. You can read on, and you can see how Abraham's descendants took on the Canaanites and... (coughs) possess the promised land. God fulfilled that promise. We can look back and see that from Abraham you trace the line to Jesus and that through Jesus he has blessed the ends of the earth. He has kept that promise. However, Abraham believed the promise of God when all he had was the promise of God. Abraham died believing the promises of God when all of these promises had not yet reached their fulfillment. Think of it this way. When Abraham died, did he have a great nation? No, the Bible says he had two kids to Sarah, his first wife, when she died. He had six more with his second wife. Was it Keturah? Is that her name? So eight kids, which I would say is a big family. I think some of you are trying. It's a big family. It's not a great nation, is it? That's not a fulfillment of the promise of God. Yet... When Abraham died, did he possess the promised land? No. In fact, you know the only thing that he had in the land? A grave. A grave that he bought that Sarah was already buried in and that he would be buried in when he died. When Abraham died, did he have a great name? No. His name was not really known out with his own little circle of his family and wider people. Does that mean that God's promise to Abraham failed? Let me read to you from a book of the Bible called Hebrews 11. This is written after Jesus. It's explaining the life of Abraham. And I want to show you that the promise of God to Abraham is bigger than him and bigger than this world. Listen tight. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. 
For he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered God faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Listen to this. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. God's promise to Abraham didn't fail just because Abraham didn't see it in his lifetime. Remember, he's blessed to be a blessing. He was going to be made into a nation to reach the nations. And so the important point wasn't that these things are fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime. The important thing is that he trusted the promise in his lifetime. The promises of God were bigger than Abraham, and this is so the fulfillment of them wasn't limited to Abraham's life. The fulfillment of the promise was bigger than this world, and so the fulfillment wasn't contained to this world. That's why, let me say it this way. It's cool that Abraham only had a grave in the promised land. Why? Because his body in that grave was like a seed planted that would bear fruit where? In heaven. That's why it's okay that Abraham did not see the fulfillment of these things in this world because many of them were fulfilled after his death and when he enters the next world. Let me say something that's massively significant for you if you're maybe just a new Christian or maybe important for you if you're struggling to leave this old world behind. Like Abraham, you will probably die <coughs> without you seeing the fulfillment of God's promises to you. That's why I feel like this life is harder, being a Christian. Because although there will be much in this world to leave behind, you will not necessarily receive the promise of God in this world. Why? It's way bigger than that. It is otherworldly, other countryly. It is heavenly. It's okay. Because our faith in Jesus is not just for this world. It's a striking thing, right? God will use you when you're dead. Prayers you've prayed, habits you've passed down, songs you've written, lessons you've taught, traditions you've established. God might use you beyond your life. But actually it's more than that. Your death will take you into the place of the fulfillment of God's promises. It is in death that we will pass into life. It will be death that takes us into the deeper relationship of the blessing of knowing God. No longer by faith, but by sight. No longer fighting sin, but free from sin. No longer in a perishable body, perishable body, but in a transformed one. No longer a stranger on this earth, but home. And no longer looking back to what we've left, but seeing Jesus face to face, the reason why we left. There's loads we might have to leave behind to follow Jesus in this world with his command to go, his command to repent. But soon you will leave this world behind and follow Jesus to the better country where all of God's wills are fulfilled. If the resurrection never happened, Christianity is pointless. But if the resurrection happens, it is proof that when God says, I will, he will. Just to finish, Jesus' boys, his disciples, struggled with this. Uh, they saw Jesus speaking to a young man, a young man, and Jesus says, Leave all your possessions, sell them to the poor, then come follow me. And they say to Jesus, Who, who then can do this? This is too hard. 
And they actually say to Jesus, Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. Listen to the promise that Jesus makes them. Mark chapter 10. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions. Life will get harder. And in the age to come, eternal life. We do not merely follow Jesus for this age, but for the age that is to come. And the resurrection is proof that when God says, I will, he will.